didn't cost very much, and it's really light, and it does not have a graphics card in it, and it's got an i3 processor, which is like limping along. But we'll see how it works anyhow. So we're streaming this live. Um, it will have gone on to YouTube by now. Here's my dashboard on YouTube Live. Okay, so stream health. Let's not look at that. <laughs> and we'll just tweet. Otherwise, we'll have zero viewers, which actually is my average number of viewers. <laughs> so I'm not too, too worried about that. But, you know, it makes an archive. So people will be able to view it later. So, okay, fully tweeted, we're on air, and just as a backup, <laughs> I've learned this from experience. And I, I realize you have a professional camera <laughs> set up there um, with a lot more than, than I could do. But I've also seen these things fail. And, and the uh, the uh, organizers come to me after and say, you know, Mr. Downs, we're very sorry, but it didn't work. And I always go, that's okay. I recorded the backup on my phone. And I've actually used my phone audio or my computer audio to provide the audio for the video that they lovingly recorded. So, okay, backup audio is now recording. Why go through this? Um, so all of this, it took me maybe five minutes to remember again how the interface works while I was sitting there. And it took me, as you just saw, a few minutes to set up. Um, but there's a difference between coming in and presenting something for the video cameras and the people in the room, and coming here and presenting something for the video cameras, the people in the room, and zero people listening live online. It may get up to one or two. I did no advance notice of this, no publicity, because this is all test mode, right? Um, but we need to be thinking about this. Oh, we have one watching. Hi, person watching. I got three. There we go. So, so now I have a larger audience than any other speaker at this session. So, and there's a lesson here. What's going to happen in the classroom in this short course? Sure. Everyone's going to watch, not the professor, but over there. But why wouldn't it, right? Yeah, uh, why wouldn't it? Now, we, the title of this talk is Designing the Learning Environment, right? The learning environment is not this room. It's a beautiful environment, and I love being here on Capri. Thank you for inviting me. Um, Thank you for coming. But it's not just that, right? And we need to see ourselves as living in the digital world as well as the physical world. And even this conference, talking about MOOCs, about as advanced people in as, in as advanced a field as possible, haven't gotten that yet. Because I'm the only one who did this. And I, I still can't believe I'm the only one who did this. How many of you recorded your talks? None, right? <laughs> what are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so that's the pre-presentation. So we'll go to the presentation. We'll make it big so the people online can see. So I, I very carefully set up my camera. Oh, for goodness sakes. All right, here we go. So I very carefully set up my camera now so they can see the slides, they can see me all of that because, you know, it's it's really hard to watch a video of a head. Um, it's really hard to watch a video of slides, both of which are crashingly boring. Put them together, it's still not the most exciting thing in the world, but we're getting there. Actually, this technology here that I'm using, uh, it can share the screen, uh, it can run videos, I can put stuff on it. I, I've yet to explore what it can do, but I'm afraid to explore what it can do on that computer. 
Um, although it's been that computer has been a workhorse. So here we go. Once you think about, well, what are you seeing here? Besides, you know, the New Year's Eve in, in, in England. <laughs> right? So if you think about what you're looking at, this is, this is a pretty interesting picture, right? There's a guy fighting with the police and maybe his girlfriend, maybe his wife, uh, a reveler down there, people watching. Some guy just walking by, it's Well Street, etc. It's kind of what you focus on, right? But what is it that makes this image great? Some of you may have seen this already, but this image is, in fact, an instance of the golden ratio, right? This is what makes this a beautiful image. Seeing this image this way is different from seeing it the other way. And being able to see the image this way is a big part of what we're up to when we're up to education, right? This way, oh, I'll try to go back here. I'm not very good at this. Seeing it this way, this is the world of content. Right? This is the world of knowledge and of stuff. This is your traditional education. This is one step forward. Seeing the patterns, seeing what's important, seeing things in perspective, seeing how this relates to underlying theory, other kinds of arts. And we can take this, and of course people have taken this one step further, <laughs> this is seeing the possibilities inherent in the image, right? And of course we have drunken guy, complete with beer, but he fits right in, doesn't he? And this could well be Capri. Well, I guess not Capri, but you know. So that's the perspective that I come to the topic of designing learning environments. Right? I'm not thinking about how to present content. I'm not thinking about subject knowledge, acquisition, transfer of knowledge, things like that. I'm thinking about ways of seeing. I'm thinking about transforming the person. And that's an important thing, and that's an important word. The MOOC, see I said the word, uh, the MOOC is a change, and it's one change in a changing educational environment. I want you to think about change generally for a bit, so we're going from the content to the golden ratio, right? So this is our field looked at from the perspective of the golden ratio. Think about the sorts of things that we talk about when we talk about change. I've kind of broken them down into two major areas. This just, you know, this isn't the way the world is, right? This is me just creating an abstraction of the world for the purpose of exposition. But there are two kinds of change, two kinds of causes of change. On the one hand, drivers, which is what everybody talks about. Uh, cost events, crises, inventions, growth, talked yesterday about, you know, uh, benefits and, and value add and things like that in the business models, right? Very important. These are all drivers of change. And, and we can put technology in there. And I put tech in light green because it isn't really, but it sort of is. There's everybody contrasts, you know, we shouldn't talk about technology, we should talk about pedagogy. But we shouldn't talk about pedagogy either. We should talk about values, goals, desires, needs. These are attractors of change. You see the difference, right? There are different, and these two things have different properties. Drivers push us, but they don't push us into any particular place. And in fact, they make us very susceptible to being pushed into a place that's very convenient for somebody, like, say, uh, Disney. 
Microsoft or whatever. Um, attractors pull us in, but they don't just pull us randomly. They pull us to something related to our values, goals, desires, needs, etc. And when educators talk about we should be focused on pedagogy, not technology, what they're trying to say, just don't have the vocabulary, is we should be focusing on attractors, not drivers. We should be focusing on our values, our goals, etc. In fact, I don't like them saying we should be focused on our <coughs> pedagogy because what they're saying when they say that is our world will never change and we will always be focused on teaching. But what if the environment isn't about teaching anymore? So you have to think more broadly than pedagogy. Okay. Which way goes forward? This way. Mimut, they say, is innovation. Mimut is disruptive innovation. Um, certainly, that's how it was portrayed by Coursera, Udacity, etc., etc., etc. People from MIT, people from Harvard, people from Open University very much appreciated the deconstruction of what open means for Open University. Uh, what is innovation? This is straight from the business text, and I rounded up a bunch of them and then abstracted. Innovation is the idea, the execution, plus the benefit, right? So the idea, hey, let's have a moot and we'll teach a thousand people or twenty thousand or whatever. The execution, that's the hard part. That's actually writing the software to do that. And then the benefit, right? and they won't count it as an innovation unless there's a benefit. Typically, that means they won't count it as an innovation unless somebody makes money. But if we go to our previous slide, could relate to our values, needs, desires, etc. The benefit speaks to the attractor. The other parts are to the, the push side of the equation, but this is to the attractor why anybody would do this in the first place. Why would anybody do this? All right, let's talk about this innovation a little bit. I'm going to skip through a few technologies fairly quickly uh, because they should be kind of background knowledge for this group, but they might not be. So one of the background technologies is learning tools, and in particular, learning tools interoperability. This is a technology that allows a platform to launch another application. And, and it's, it's a way of doing this in a general way so that you're not writing applications specific to platforms. So normally the way this works is your learning management system, or as they like to call themselves now, your learning technologies platform, uh, We'll use this, and so your tool consumer will be your LMS. I'm still going to use that word. Your tool provider will be uh, some piece of artificial intelligence or some quiz application or whatever. And it will launch it. It will run it for the students, send back some stuff. So we kind of did that last year, except we did it a bit different. We used LTI to launch a learning management system. Um, now doing that with Open edX, I will tell you, was what they call a nightmare. Um, because it's Open edX is supposed to support LTI, it's supposed to be able to be launched in this way, but in fact it isn't. Uh, but we worked our way through it and so what's happening here, this is LPSS, this is our personal learning environment, and inside LPSS is a course that was authored in uh, Open edX. And if you click on any one of these things, it'll pop open the actual content window from Open edX. Uh, so yesterday morning when I tried it, it was working fine. Yesterday afternoon when I tried it, when I was making this slide, uh, the server, the Open edX was crashing, so I don't have a nice picture of that, but I have a pre-picture. So that's one technology. Here's another technology, very important, cloud storage, right? 
You're probably all very used to this by now. Uh, this is the, you know, I'm Dropbox, which I got here, is the tip of the iceberg. One of the innovations that the, uh, the uh, American MOOCs did bring to the table that we didn't do with our MOOC is they used a lot of cloud storage in the background, and you didn't see it. They used things like Amazon Web Services, right? Now that's, you don't see that in the open edX, right? Maybe in the closed edX it's there, but in the open edX it's not. Uh, I'm, I don't know, I can't say for sure what Coursera or Udacity use. I know they use something. Uh, because, but their source isn't open, so I can't examine that, right? But they have to be using something because that's how you scale to 150,000 people with a $10 application, which is what they did. Amazon too. That's what I thought. So, from the consumer point of view, we have Dropbox, Google Drive, Microsoft OneDrive, Tubby, and a whole bunch of other things. In our personal learning environment, we skipped the middleman, and we went straight from personal learning environment to cloud storage. This is my actual Dropbox account inside my personal learning environment. No need to go through the LMS, right? Authentication. <laughs> oh, I, I've missed my little boxy thingy. But okay, authentication is a nightmare. Um, so, but it, this is one of these rapidly changing things. Uh, I was back there at the beginning when they created Open ID um, and, and actually developed a precursor to that system. Open ID, of course, was immediately commodified by companies like Google and Facebook and others who then undercut Open ID in order to destroy the open alternative. So now you have to sign. I tried to write a comment on National Post the other day. You must log in with your Facebook account to comment on this newspaper site in Canada. It's just ridiculous, right? Um, I've been looking at what Tim Berners-Lee has been doing with Solid. Uh, Solid includes an authentication server and it's got tons of security built into it. But more importantly, it's a distributed system. It goes back to what was desired in OpenID, uh, but it does it in a much more secure fashion than um, uh, other efforts have been to this point in time. But, you know, authentication, there's going to be, there will be, there is, and there will be all kinds of innovation around that. Uh, outcomes and competencies. So this is interesting. Now in LPSS, we built a competency system with a competency profile, used that competency profile in order to recommend resources. Uh, interestingly, Moodle 3.1, when Moodle 3.1 came out, it included a whole competency thing. I, I can't summarize it here, that would be the whole presentation. But everything you want to know about competencies has been built into that. And again, what competencies are being used for a lot of the time is to associate a learning objective with a learning resource. So, hang on. Learning plans, again, ties into competency ties into recognition like badges, etc. And again, in LPSS, we had the competencies, we have the learning record, which represents the, uh, the outcome of that. All of these things that are, were part of the learning management system now are becoming part of a personal learning environment. The learning process, this could be something out of uh, the Learning Activity Management System, or LAMS, that was created 10 years ago or so by James Delzell. I forget what it's from, I just copied it from Google somewhere. And again, in LPSS, we use competencies in order to create that. Now, just as an aside, all of this stuff from you that you're seeing from LPSS, all of that's been shelved now. 
and I'm no longer running this program, and they've decided to go into learning analytics. So I'm a little bit cynical, <laughs> but, uh, but that's what we did. And of course, open educational resources. People try to tell me there's a shortage of learning content online. I laugh at them. <laughs> right. What they mean is there's a shortage of content produced by well, content produced in the Federico mode, right, with professors and universities and all of that. But that said, there is a ton of content about everything. And a big part of the learning process needs to be uh, the, the discovery, the curation, the commentary on, the leveraging, the associating, etc., of that content. There's so much there. This is just a small sample and doesn't even include a number of my favorite sites. Again, this is just an image I snagged off of Google Image because it was there. Now, change point. Everything I've described to you so far is actually pretty ordinary and traditional. Right? It's kind of leading edge technologically, but it's all push. Right? It's all drivers still at this point. There are some affordances, but it's all drivers. And when people look at that, especially this crowd, you're going to look at that and say, well, where's the pedagogy there? Where's the learning there? Et cetera, et cetera. Because you want attractors. Right? So let's do the critical part first. If you take all of that technology and mix it with Microsoft's version, this is their candidate as an attractor, here's what they think learning should be. Learning community, teacher capacity, efficient schools, personalization, we'll come back to that, physical learning environments, curriculum and assessment, etc., etc. Is that really the image that we have for education in the future, either at the higher education level or at the uh, public and primary level. I contend not. I contend that this isn't what we're up to. Let's think about this. We need to represent MOOCs and learning technology beyond simple disruptive innovation. Disruptive innovation is here, where you begin with your drivers and attractors already defined. Right? Your drivers, of course, are the technology, the attractors, that's you know, the Microsoft Learning Vision, etc. Then you innovate by producing an idea, execution plus benefit. Learning technologies, interoperability, for example, or cloud storage, Amazon Web Services in the back end. And you have innovation. But what happens when this benefit, these attractors, are not taken as a given? What happens when we start thinking about other desired benefits, other desired goals, desires, ambitions, and indeed even pedagogy if that's the direction you want to go? Well, your benefit changes. Our attractor if you will, over time, because we're in a chaotic environment, is what they call a strange attractor. It's not a fixed point. It's not even a point that's moving consistently. It's a point that shifts and drifts around as the environment changes. And that's what we should be thinking about. So let's redefine the benefit and then have the idea and execution that gives us transformation. And what we were always up to with MOOCs was not disruptive innovation, but rather transformation. The MOOCs that we saw in the United States, in fact, are very conservative iterations of technology, keeping the benefit the same, and for that matter, keeping the beneficiaries the large universities, the very well-to-do people who can afford to go to large universities, keeping them the same. Transformation is a change in the thing itself that we are doing. 
And this is, this is the issue I've had with MOOCs generally and the way MOOCs have gone about designing for learning environments, right? Indeed, the, the, if you will, identity of MOOCs, right? We're thinking about trying to do the same thing we've always been doing again, except we're going to call it MOOCs and make it open. But really, if we look at what is needed, wanted, desired, etc., on the part of our learners, that drives us toward changing the nature of what it is that we're doing itself. We're no longer teaching content to deliver people into the job market. Because, let's be honest, nobody wants a job. They want the things that a job will get, <laughs> right? <laughs> so we, we need to understand what we're selling here, as they say. Right? Uh, we're not selling people a job. We're, we're, we're trying to help them transform themselves into capable, dare I say, innovative, uh, empowered individuals who can make their way through life, maybe with a job, maybe through some other process. Because the world of jobs is, you know, we're entering the age of robots. Uh, I, for one, welcome our new robot overlords, because it means I won't need a job anymore. <laughs> what are the needs, values, etc.? Yeah. This is, of course, Maslow's hierarchy, but <laughs> the first thing I disrupted when I stepped up here was your Wi-Fi access, and that hit me where you lived. <laughs> <laughs> Maslow, let's look at Maslow. The top of Maslow's hierarchy, well, you know, like, physiological safety and security, Donald Trump puts this at the top. <laughs> Belonging, self-esteem, self-actualization. There are many societies in which this hierarchy is different. Um, you know, I, I know, you know my, my friends in the First Nations communities in Canada wouldn't put self-actualization there. They, they put something. They wouldn't even put belonging there. They put something like harmony or you know being in tune with nature or something like that. Uh, uh, people from uh, Eastern Asia might put belonging above self-actualization. The point is, we can't just sit here and say, oh, we know what everybody wants. That's a ridiculous statement, isn't it? This is why, you know, there's a fundamental tension, the whole concept of what is it to design a MOOC anyways? What is it to design a technology for 150,000 people when you know the 150,000 people have 150,000 different sets of desires, needs, ambitions, goals, etc. So, what we're trying to do is help them make their way in the world. What we're trying to do is, well, I, I like to think of it as I don't want to say make them into scientists because that's not quite right, but I can use this as a metaphor and that will help. Uh, people have this historical view of science as going out collecting facts and then creating a generalization out of those facts and then doing a hypothesis, testing that hypothesis, confirming that hypothesis and saying, oh, I have a natural principle now. That is not how science works. That is not how education works. That is not how thought works. Uh, that is an old model of science called the deductive nominological model. It was created in the middle of the last century by a school of philosophers called logical positivists. They were discredited in the 1970s. It just kills me that still people are still working with this view. Science really, in the real world, is a combination, if you will, of evaluating evidence, coordinating evidence and models, and arriving at evidence-based judgments that are communicated through argumentation. What does that mean? It means, as Thomas Kuhn said, you don't acquire a bunch of knowledge to become a physicist. You become a physicist to become a physicist. You change yourself. You put yourself into a community that has standards of what counts as evidence, 
has standards of what counts as using evidence, what counts as a model, what counts as judgment, and what counts as argumentation, communication, etc. That's the thinking that went into the MOOCs that we developed in 2008. There's some of the thinking. It's not all of the thinking. There's some of the thinking. Right? And you guys saw this last year. Right? Instead of seeing a course as a series of contents to be presented, we thought of it as an environment, a network-based environment, a distributed environment, into which learners would immerse themselves. There was no body of content. The concept of completing a MOOC was in our uh, model meaningless. Right? What is it? You know, think of this as, you know, this is a course, right? Uh, it's kind of like a map of Rome, shall we say. <laughs> right? And what is it to complete Rome? The concept is meaningless, right? What is it to complete Capri? Is it to walk on every road? Uh, is it to invade every person's backyard? To eat all the grapes on the grape vines? <laughs> just makes no sense. And that shows how fundamentally different this vision is from the vision of a MOOC where you are trying just to present a bunch of contents. Talking about personalized versus personal. Personalized is this content based approach. Personalized is where a college or a university gathers a bunch of content, defines an ideal knowledge state that you will practice and be tested on according to published requirements, and then your instructor will correct you. And you, you get to try in, in adaptive, modern adaptive learning, you get to try again. In traditional learning, you just fail. Right? This is a model where the ideal state, the benefit, is predefined by the institution. But there is no benefit that applies to 150,000 people, or even 25 people in a room. Personal learning is where you begin with the benefit as defined by the individuals who are actually receiving the education, who are in fact, in my view, the most important people in the equation, without which there's really no point. So somebody yesterday talked about stakeholders, and I knew what that meant. Right? But if you take away the student, the interests of the stakeholders becomes meaningless. Right? Every input from a stakeholder is an attempt to define this rather than a recognition that this is what is important. The desired state, the desired goal or objective, etc., of the person. In, this is, in informal learning, this is often characterized as the completion of a task or a project. It's not even defined in terms of knowledge. I just want to fix my pump. That's what I want to do, right? The university will recommend a 10-week course on pumps, right? I just want to fix my pump, and I want to do it today because it's leaking, and I have water all over the floor, right? You go in, and you try, and you do. That's the first thing you do is you go in and you do. You're messing around with Google Live. You do. You get into the community. You do, right? And the technology and the environment create affordances. Uh, in the old parlance, they offer you a set of tools. Really, what they offer you is a set of capacities, things that you could do, things that you could employ to help you achieve your desired state. And that produces an outcome. And that outcome is the content. And we were talking about what is the value of uh, MIT Media Lab yesterday. And the thing is, you know, in, in Media Lab, they learn maybe 10% of what's going on is them learning stuff. The other 90% of that, of that is them working on stuff, trying to make stuff, and in fact, coming up with new knowledge 
that they've created themselves and that will characterize that community as they go forth into the world. And the value proposition that the university is giving to those students, which is why they want so desperately to get there, is this new knowledge, which never existed before, and this network of connections who know this new knowledge, who share the way of talking about it, what counts as evidence about it, what counts as proof, conversation, etc. And indeed, even who counts as being in the conversation and who doesn't, which is most of the world. Your instructor is there not to test you, but to help you. And with each iteration, with each try, that creates an opportunity, and you try again, and you try again, and you try again, and over time you build up a series of either failures or successes, or probably a bit of both. What is the evaluation and the assessment of learning on this model? We are using basically this community, this online community in our MOOCs, this physical community in case of Media Lab. We're using one of these to actually create neural networks, to create people who see the world in a certain way, who see not just the drunkard lying on the street, but who see the golden ratio in the picture, right? That's what we're creating. We're not creating this person knows this, knows this, knows this. We're not creating this is a body that can get a job. We're creating this kind of person. A person who is a physicist who sees the world the way a physicist does. A person who is a chemist and sees the world the way a chemist does. And people talk about assessment. Assessment works in reverse. You have one of these. I think I'm a physicist. How am I going to prove that? Would I take a test? No, I wouldn't take a test. Nobody would believe me. I'm going to go to a community of physicists and try to talk like a physicist. And they will know within about two minutes whether or not I'm a physicist, won't they? And you actually hear them talk about that. Right? If I'm really a physicist, I can pass myself off as a physicist to other real physicists. If I'm not, I can't. And the sad part is, though, people who are not physicists, who haven't acquired that knowledge, aren't aware of that until they actually try to get into the community of physicists and have the feedback. You see that in philosophy a lot of times. Everybody in the world is a philosopher. Um, but my formal education is in philosophy. And when I talk with somebody, I can tell when, within the first two or three sentences whether they're a philosopher or whether they have actually studied philosophy. It's, you just see the world differently. You know, it's like, you know, I want to ask you, when you see that picture, what do you see? And you give me an answer. That tells me right away whether you're seeing the golden ratio or whether you're seeing the drunk. <laughs> <laughs> design. Right? So, there's learning design, properly so called, and then there's learning environments. We can mess around with the metaphors quite a bit here, and I can do a whole talk just on this, right? Because it breaks down into seven easy sections. It's a, it's a self-writing list of books. Uh, you know, design, the traditional model is a path, a course, a sequence. We cover some content. We achieve levels or thresholds or badges. Uh, we're positioned first in the class, last in the class, best university in the world, worst university in the world. We have objectives or goals that we're trying to attain. A certain number of us won't attain them. We will be failures. And, of course, it depends crucially on leading and being led. That's the traditional model. The environment model is intended to upend that. It's a transformation. We're not trying to do that anymore. So, we still have the curriculum, but it's more like a map now. And, and I can talk a lot about that. There's a core, there's a periphery, uh, but the, you know, there is a certain set of foundations. There's a whole talk we can do on what really is a foundation in math, for example. Um, there's inquiry, there's discovery, there's gaps, there's coverage, there's construction, but there's also 
advanced techniques from artificial intelligence, grouping, clustering, emergence, etc., all of which can be applied to environments, can't be applied to a path. And there's emotional centeredness. Centeredness around an area, centeredness around a cluster. These are the kinds of things that we're trying to capture in this kind of design. Of course, again, my group went back to learning analytics, which is boring and analytical. And so, so rooted in the 1950s. Method is discovery, right? Method as you're exploring, method as you're, you're trying to become an inhabitant of Rome rather than a tourist, say. Uh, these are various properties, I won't go into them in any detail, but different literacies which allow you to converse with your environment, different skills which allow you to function effectively as a part of a network, and then some core values that I think are important because they lead to properly functioning networks, but I would hesitate to call them universal. But things like autonomy, diversity, openness, and interaction, these are, to me, the values that would lead one to be an educated individual in a knowing society. That's a mouthful. So, final home stretch. It's almost time. Then you can have coffee. <laughs> then now you don't eat coffee. So, in prehistory, five years ago, we had a browser and our browser would access everything we needed from a learning management system, Moodle, D2O, robot car. Okay, we didn't have a robot car yet. But that's still the picture that people have of robot cars, right? Um, and then things got a lot more modern, uh, I mean, just as an aside, and this is the model that the first, uh, you know, the, the, I call them the corporate MOOCs or the X MOOCs adopted, right? So, browser and you access Udacity, Coursera, and X or whatever. But we get modern, and our learning management systems access a whole set of other systems in the background. So here's our, I dropped the robot car because I don't want to put GPS and all of that in there. But browser, right, accesses Moodle. Moodle in turn accesses data from the cloud, might tap into an identity service like Shibboleth or EduRealm or whatever. It'll access various services, etc. These even might tie into additional backends like the student information system at the university, other content services, etc. And so that's why Desire to Learn wants to call itself a learning platform because it doesn't have everything in it anymore. It connects to all of these things. And these are, in the end, little applications like those Facebook apps that you have. They're like education apps that can run on the learning platform. And so it all runs through D2L. D2L wants to be the Facebook of education. They all want to be the Facebook of education. They all want to be the Google Plus of education, right? This serves the old model. This keeps the existing people running the show. This does not advance the idea of a learning community or a learning environment because Facebook is in the community. Facebook is a proprietary advertising network, right? It's not a real community. If it was a real community, my, I could put whatever I wanted into there. If it was a real community, I could move data in and out easily. If it was a real community, I could avoid the advertisements. And Facebook is determined to make sure you do not avoid the advertisements. Here's where we're going. This is a rough diagram. I should do it better, but here you are. You still access these things because they're so useful. You still want your robot card. Um, but your stuff now is your stuff, not 
desire to learn stuff or Facebook stuff. And you don't need to use Moodle or U2L as an intermediary to get to it. Your data lives in your cloud. Your identity is in your identity provider. Your social network is your social network. Doesn't belong to Facebook, doesn't belong to Twitter or LinkedIn, and I, I should go along with these services. In other words, the services, including LTI, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that were accessed through the learning platform, are in the future going to be accessed, accessed directly by the individual learner. And they will access a range of services that is appropriate to their particular needs and desires. So it's a simple little example of how this works. If you're getting all of your services from Moodle, say content, this content here, especially in Europe, has to be in like 20 different languages, right? Because Moodle is going to serve it to everybody. And you have to select the language that you want. And that's why you get in XML and etc. the abomination of the language string tag. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I just hate it. But if you're accessing stuff yourself, just access it in the language that you want. And you don't need to access the same thing in 20 different languages. Or even better, just access the thing you want, plug it into, well not there, but plug it into the service, which is a translator, and it'll translate it for you. Or something. Right? Something. So people can set their own individual preferences rather than the provider having to try to account for all the different hundreds of thousands of, of different settings. So instead of, and I'm borrowing a phrase here, I think it's from Audrey Waters, but I'm not sure. Instead of forcing the user to adapt to the technology and what the technology can do, the technology is instead adapted to the user. And that will be the fundamental change in our approach to education and our approach to design as we go forward. This is, this is a transformation of education. We have always tried to make students like us, or some reasonable facsimile of us. And that objective is changing. We can't do that anymore. If people behave like us in the future, that will be a catastrophe. They have to be better. Um, and so they have to have the capacity to find their own way to make their own world, to design their own learning. That's what I've got. I'm sorry it was too long. Now begins the process of shutting down. <laughs> Um, we'll take the coffee break now because we're already um, late for the coffee break. Can we try and reduce that to 15 minutes? Or is that too short? You're okay. So 15 minutes, and so that will make it back here at uh, quarter two. And then Natasha, and then the discussion based on these uh, four initial presentations before we then move on to the second part. So if you could save your questions. Uh, after the coffee break and after the session. Thanks. I may experience performance issues. <laughs> All right, bye bye.